It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Lin Weiping. Uh, Professor Lin has a PhD in anthropology from Cambridge University. Um, she's a professor in the Department of Anthropology at National Taiwan University, where she's also a former chair. Uh, this year, she's an associate with Harvard Yenching Institute. Um, she's published widely on popular religion in Taiwan, uh, including on topics like spirit possession and um, uh, her book, I want to make sure I get the title right, her book, Materializing Magical Power, I always say it magical, Materializing Magic Power, Chinese Popular Religion in Villages and Cities in, in um, uh, was published in two, 2015 by Harvard University Press, on, and it won the Academia Sinica's prize for best monograph. There's a lot to appreciate about this book, and um, I want to just say a couple of things about it, particularly the way that it, it works back and forth between rural and urban places as it describes histories of folk religion. But you know, the thing that, um, that I love most about this book is an image of at the center, a very careful analysis of how god icons, you know, um, statues of Taoist gods, are crafted in Taiwan by carvers who, who hollow out the back and place inside um, materials like, I don't know, hornets and ashes and talismans and various kinds of metal, e e metals, each one of which connects that god to, relates that god to something like the weather or its um, spirit armies or the, the, its place of origin. Um, and then, and then the, the god's eyes are opened by um, dotting the, the eyes and it, and it becomes alive. And then, as, and then it's, it's um, bound to its, its village territory with a fire walking, cer walking ceremony. And then it starts to accumulate relationships with human beings as it presides over ceremonies and, um, and, uh, and, you know, and, and communicates with human beings about their, their, <coughs> their daily problems. And in this way becomes something that might be called a person. Um, and I, I just love this image because it's, it's, it's really helped me in my own way to, in my own work to, to think about how dead bodies might become persons in some ritual context. Um, but Professor Lean has moved on from then. She's now working, uh, finishing a, a book manuscript, polishing a book manuscript on the um, popular religion and, and, and imagination in, in these islands between China and Taiwan. Um, and that's the project from which her talk today comes. And she also is working in a really exciting way on new media in Chinese popular religion. Um, what happens when, um, when you know, gods become iPhone apps and shamans start communicating largely on WeChat? Um, but that's for another time. Um, and today's talk is gambling in the state in the military islands between China and Taiwan. So please welcome. Professor. It's my great pleasure to speak here. Thank you, Eric, for inviting me and uh, such generous introduction. Um, I also like to thank Anna for arranging everything, but she, she's not here. Um, okay, so uh, uh, Professor Mugler has already started uh, to introduce my second book, and this is the, the first section of my first, uh, the first section, the historical section of my, my book. So, okay, then. Um, I like to talk about the, uh, the military islands uh, between Taiwan and China. As you can see from this map, there are two Taiwanese uh, military uh, island uh, groups along the China coast. So uh, the, the southern one, uh, the southern one is called Jingmen. Uh, the, yeah, the southern one is called Jingmen. It's comparatively larger and uh, long settled. You know, it has a long history and much more well developed. So uh, it has already attracted many historians and including anthropologists who did research in this area. And also because it's much bigger, you know, it's very close to Shaman. So um, for example, Professor uh, Mugler told me yesterday when he was in Shaman, he actually saw people from, you know, this islands. And the northern, the northern, the northern group, it's uh, called Mazu. It's made of a small and scattered islands with limited resources. So, so it has received very little attention because only islands and then, you know, the total, uh, 
these I these islets, for example, just 10, 10 square uh, 10 square kilo kilometers. So uh, it's very small and then receive very little tr uh, attention. So my talk today, the aim of my talk today will be uh, to investigate how the people of the Mazu Islands experience, contend, and live with the military rule in terms of their own culture, in particular their gambling habits. Uh, uh, I'd like to uh, remind you, not just resist or, or, you know, um, or confront in the state, but how they endure, how they live with the state. That's my, uh, 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 my, my major focus. So I will briefly, I will briefly introduce the, the history of these islands and then move on to gambling. So um, let me introduce uh, the, the islands in more detail to you. The Mazu Islands comprise an archipelago along the northeast coast of Fujian. As you can see from, from here, they, uh, these islands are, these islets are Xi'in, Dongyin, Beigan, Nangan, Xiju, and Zhongju. So they are located in the eastern part, eastern part of Fujian. Fujian. So um, before 1949, uh, these islanders were, you know, they, they were most of them, all of them, almost, you know, were fishermen. So you can see they uh, they basically caught fish in the sea and then sold it to the uh, eastern part, the Fuzhou area, Lianjiang or Changle area. So um, so these fishing activities integrated the Mazu, these islands with the eastern Fujian as a whole. I mean, economically or politically, in every way, they are in integrated as a whole. So, um, so the islands before 1949, they were stateless. Uh, how to say that? In, in history, I mean, the south, southeast outer islands in general were forbidden you know, they were forbidden outposts uh, in, uh, in historical documents. They were called Wayang Jing Shan. Um, people were not really allowed, you know, illegal to, to, to go there. So the cultivation of the islands were made legal only in 1790 by Qianlong Emperor. So, um, okay, so, so, but for these even smaller islands, you know, it wasn't until 19, 1934 that the state institute a security office was established for the very first time. So you can imagine how stateless this, this place was. Yet in less than two years, the head of the, you know, the office was shot dead by the bandit. So then afterwards, you know, afterwards, the, these, these were islands were occupied either by, or, you know, governed or occupied by either bandits or pirates. Very chaotic, you know, very chaotic. So, um, so okay, S even now you still can see their footprint, these bandits' footprint. For example, in the, nor uh, it's, uh, in the northern island, you can see, you still, now when you go there, you still can see the pi a, pirate uh, a pirate house in Beigan, and it was built in 1940s. So the person who built it, you know, uh, got killed without even living there for one day. So you see, you can imagine the, how chaotic this, this place is. So, um, uh, okay, so the islanders, you know, they, they, they say it in the, you know, they, they have a, their own dialect. So the islanders say that Ma the Mazu was a place where uh, who, whose fist is biggest takes everything, whose, you know, physical power. So these bandits or pirates, you know, if you are strong, you can just uh, take, it, take it away. Then, um, okay, then the islands before 1949 were also fragmented. How to say fragmented? Uh, for example, uh, this photo, it's where I conducted my field site, you know, and um, okay, uh, each island was independently connected to China. They had no sense of village or island community. How, 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 why do I say that? Um, for example, when village, you know, move to these, uh, the, these uh, place, they firstly dwell, you know, they firstly dwell, uh, build their sh uh, shelters or houses al along the inlet. And then gradually the houses, you know, uh, extended up hills. But in general, the richer people, you know, the, all, all the richer people wanted to be close to the islet because of fishing. 
So um, the people who lived there before 19, 1949, they were facing China. They were facing outwards, not inside the islands. So they don't have the sense of community or village at all because their connection was with China. So in their own dialect, they, they say in, you know, they said it, for the earlier residents, going to Mazu means going to outer mountains. They, they, they said Konyelan, Nyelan means out, you know, out, outer mountains. They said going China, meaning returning home. Kotolie, you know, going, you know, they are returning home. So Mazu Islands, you know, uh, these islands, islands were not even an immigrant, uh, immigrant society, but a temporary place to live where, where people, you know, with people coming and going in a constant um, state of flux. So these, these islands, you know, even now you, you go there, you, you found that their houses are shabby. There are no, you know, luxurious houses there. They have that kind of, uh, you know, they are always, you know, moving to somewhere. Before it's China, now it's, it's Taiwan. Okay, um, so the islands, you know, the island society during this period was characterized by transience and brokenness. As I said, you know, pirates can come anytime. You know, they are, they are preparing to, you know, they, they, they were ready to co go home anytime. So everything changed with the coming of army in 1949, Chiang Kai-shek's army. So the fact that Ma, uh, Mazu became a military front line in 1949 was a historical contingency. It's not really planned. It's a product of ac actions, of the actions of three countries. Um, a Harvard historian, Michael Zoni, has a book on this, and he has already studied this because he studied a thousand uh, 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 islands, Jinmen. So he, he, uh, he, he, uh, he told us it's the actions of three countries. Firstly, it's the United States, who, which wanted to consolidate the East Asian line of defense <coughs> during the Cold War. Second is China which tried to avoid two Chinas because they felt if they took over these islands by uh, either Jinmen or Mazu, they would, they, they would leave Taiwan alone on the, you know, at the other side of the street and Taiwan may go for independence. So, so they would rather you know, keep this two, these two groups of island for Taiwan. And thirdly, Taiwan itself, you know, because Chiang Kai-shek, you know, of course, wanted to protect Taiwan from China. And he also used it as a symbol to show that he still rules China. For example, he named this Mazu Islands as Lianjiang County officially. Of course, they are not Lianjiang County, right? The Lianjiang County, the real Lianjiang County is here. So in the world, they are two Lianjiang County, you know, because he wanted to show that he still ruled China. So he set up this another Lianjiang County on this island. Okay, so the army in 1955, started to set up a war zone administration. It's a, it's a very, you know, very incom, you know, uh, encompassing uh, administration, and it lasts until uh, 1992. It subordinated all the civil affairs to the military um, command. As you can see, the chair, the war zone admin, administra administration chair was taken by the highest commanding military officer. So he ruled everything, Lianjiang County government. So he, you know, the, the army ruled everything there. But this, this, uh, this administration is not, you know, it's also a modernizing project. For example, it, you know, it has health, it has departments of health and hygiene. It set up agricultural improvement station, uh, and then it has a Mazu Electric Company. I mean, this one, this would never ever appear in this island before. So this is a totally modernized project, you know, modernizing state, which certainly came to this place. Right, and they also had their uh, newspaper, the Mazu Daily, which was distributed, still distributed in in these islands, um, only publishing news about the islanders. They even have their own currency, Mazu currency. Right, these uh, currency can be on limited uh, in you know in 
you know, for use in this island. So uh, this is a slogan erected in a very busy transportation hub on the, on the, on the major road. So you can see uh, here, dreaming uh, is Tongdao Yiming. All islanders share one life, right? Uh, so you see, before the uh, the fate of the, you know the, the the everything is connected. The islanders, the life is was connected with China, but now the army told them, you know, islanders were, you know, you share the the the, the same life, right? You share one life. So Bansu Islands become an imagined community in the sense of Benedict Anderson. So you can see everything, you know, it's it in the in, you know, included in the islands itself. So, um, but the truth, you know, the truth is that islanders' understandings of the military state are actually much more complicated. They are not just resisting or confronting the state. The massive improvements of infrastructure, as I said, as I mentioned earlier, and the ubiquitous school, school set up by the army met with the pro people's proposal. Because before, when they want, there's no, uh, there was no elementary school. So when, when they wanted to study, they had to hire teachers from, from, from China, from Fuzhou. And then if they want to, if the children want to study more, uh, you know, then they had to go to Fuzhou, I mean, for mid-school, right? So they, they actually, you know, that when I interviewed them, they, they told me, you know, they told me they are grateful for what the army has done in this island. You know, they are grateful for the army's contribution to, the, to this very once barren island, so very different from Jinmen. Um, okay, but, 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 the islanders sacrifice their freedom, right? The freedom of the Mazu people was completely circumscribed. For example, this is the island, the major island I did my research, Nangan, the, 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 southern, the southern island. You can see full of you know, military bases and checkpoints. In such a small island, they are, they are, there were 95 military bases and checkpoints, totally separated the island from the outside mm -hmm. world, right? So they were sort of imprisoned and, and circ uh, circumscribed in, in a way, this is what I, you know, the, the paper will be talking about. So you, you won't be surprised that fishing economy declined because, because after Mazu was militarized, the, mo the movements of the fishermen on the seas were deemed to threaten the national security because these fishermen, they went, they went on the sea, they may exchange something, they exchange military, you know, news or something to, with, with China communist spies, right, communist spies. So, so the state implemented a series of strict rules to reduce any potential threat and then made fishing more and more difficult. For example, they only allowed the fishermen to go to the sea from 6, um, 6 a.m. in the morning and then they had to come back in 7 p.m. If you are if you know fishing a little bit, you know fish was, you know, fishing economy actually is done in the evenings, right? So you can, I mean, you can, you can imagine how much suffer, you know, the fishing economy almost went, you know, went down. And then that's why they had to leave to work in factories in Taiwan. They, a lot of people just moved from 1970s onward to 1990s. When war zone administration, you know, from 19, 1970s to 1990s, this period, the population of Mazu reduced by two thirds, from one, one, 10,000 to almost, you know, four, four, 4,000. So I asked them, they told me, there's no way to live on Mazu. There's no hope because their economy, this, the, the, their major economy they relied on were you know, was declining so much. So they moved to, to you know, this, uh, you know, industrial area in tai, Taiwan. And it's also the period when Taiwan was industrialized. So many Western uh, uh, factories, uh, you know, set up their, uh, 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 
set up their factories in Taoyuan area. So a lot of them now move there. So my field work also two sides. You know, I have to run before these two places. Okay, but at the same time, a lot of things were happening and changing in Mazu too. For example, the army established an elementary schools. Basically, every every village has one. You know, the, has one uh, elementary school. And they also designed, the army also designed guaranteed admission program for Mazu students to study in Taiwan. Because they know, you know, they have to raise up the, 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 the education. I mean, either for ideological control or, you know, for, for, for their, you know, they have to use the human resource there. So, so they set up, they raise up the, 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 uh, the education. So when these people, when they, you know, when they send people to study in Taiwan, so um, when these students finish their studies, they were required to return to serve as the uh, as elementary school teachers or work in county uh, government for two years, and then of course they stay because you know they were encouraged to stay. So a new social category appeared in Mazu. This is very important. New local elites teachers and gov government employees started to, to appear and then superseded traditional family and lineage forces or the old elites who receive education in Fuzhou. So these new elites, uh, you know, started to, to, you know, gradually, you know, became important. Those who graduated from elementary school, I mean, the lower level, you know, the, they did not go to Taiwan to, res to get higher education. They, they also began to have opportunities to find jobs in local government, although most of them work at the very lowest uh, levels, right? Because they probably only graduated from elementary school. So they couldn't uh, go for the top, you know, top ones. So, but, but even them, you know, even they can't, uh, do fi they can't do fishing anymore. They got another uh, job opportunity. And uh, for the less, the least well-educated people, they could sell vegetables, fish, and shellfish to soldiers, right? So many other businesses, such, such as snack stands, uh, small grocery stores, billiard rooms, laund uh, laundry services, etc. All these, uh, you know, uh, uh, businesses which uh, serve the army, also arose to serve the needs of the soldier. So uh, these so uh, at home, but not, not at home, in, in Mazu, they call it apinge sengi, means soldier's business. But in English, I, I saw, uh, for example, <laughs> my cousin uh, translated into GI Joe business. So I, uh, I took his, uh, his, his term. And then you can see these, these are the people who, sell, he, who sold uh, things on, in the market mostly women. So they are, you know, <coughs> they were selling things, you know, uh, these are sh shell, shell fishes or, or, or fishes, uh, yeah. For example, this one. Women were selling, you know, fishes, uh, uh, sorry, fish to, to, to the army. So the rise of boss lady, Lao uh, Bai because, you know, uh, pre it, before 1949, uh, uh, during the fishing period, it's men who went to the sea to do fishing, right? Women stayed at home. They can't go to, you know, they can't, they could not get on boats, right? So they look after the household. They have no income. Whereas under the Wuzhong administration, women started to participate in the market economy. They became so-called boss ladies, Niang, and contributed major income to the households. You know, they can sell everything, vegetable, everything. So, so their status also started to change. Okay. Um, oh, okay. With this background knowledge, then I move on. I move to gambling. What I, you know, which is the focus of the, uh, the talk today. Um, then I start with uh, talk about what gambling in the past and then what uh, gambling became in uh, during the military period. Before 1949, the men in Mazu had a tradition of drinking and gambling. Whether uh, after, a, after an exhausting day out at sea or while waiting for the tide, gambling was a dividing way to pass the time and constituted the major male leisure on the island. As men drank and gambled, they, they could naturally ex, you know, exchange the, the, the fishing information and social news. So it's a very important socializing uh, activity for men. 
if a man who did not drink or gamble showed that he had neither money nor power. As the Mazu saying reveals, no whoring, no gambling, ancestors are ashamed. Oh, what a weird people they are. Bu piao bu zu, zu shang wu guang, me piu me du, da lo gong zu. They said, oh, yeah, I was very shocked when, they, when I first heard about this, 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 totally shocked. And then they also say, better to give first to a prodigal son than a fool. Uh, this Fuzhou dialect is too, too complicated. I'm not going to <laughs> read it. So why, why they told me? Because a prodigal son gives a family a chance of success, whereas a foolish son only eats up its assets, right? No hope for them. But however, uncontrolled gambling can be ruinous to the family. So the Mazu people also emphasize either whoring or gambling, you still have to face your ancestors. Piu piu du zu, ziya da zu, to zu, meaning piao piao du zu. You have to see your ancestors, so you have to balance yourself. So this is the way, you know, that you have to face, right. So, um, okay, so gambling represented the adventurous or even audacious characters of the islanders because they are fishing, they are facing the sea. They are facing, you know, such a barren place. If you, if you stick in the island, you have no future. So you have to, men have to go out, you know, men have to go out and then take risk, right? Um, so, okay, so when the army came, oh, they found, how come these Mazu people were so fond of gambling? So the Wuzong administration detested gambling from the first. Nearly every year, the Mazu Daily continually reported the, the arrest of gamblers, such as, I quote, uh, the Mazu Daily wrote, 56 participants in gambling ring are arrested, including two government officials, tw uh, 26 businessmen, 15 fishermen, three visitors, and 10 women. Okay, uh, government officials, women. So before, it's only men who gamble, but now government officials, women, or started to you know report it. This is not just this is not just one you know single case. A lot like this, you got caught. Your name's just you know publicly uh, announced in the in the newspaper. So uh, okay, so not just that, but the police also publicly burned gambling equipment almost every year. So, and then the war zone administration chair, the highest uh, commanding officer, would be at the scene to supervise and express how serious these, uh, the, author the authorities use this issue. So, but, but, but the effect is not obvious. It, it, in, uh, from, Mazu, from the Mazu daily, you will see that, that I quote, although officials have put a strict ban in place, addicted offenders have continued the, uh, their own ways in disregard of the law. So authorities, what, what can they do? They, they can only implement it increasingly harsh laws on this. So they are implemented importation and sales regulation. Uh, you, all the mazu shops were not allowed to sell gambling equipment and they were not allowed to import gambling uh, uh, equipment from Taiwan. So then they gradually, you know, then in 1982, uh, the Mazu Daily even announced anyone who worked for the government, including all of office workers and service workers, will be fired immediately if, it, if they were found to, to be engaging in gambling. And then in 1983, the Mazu Daily even announced that gambling is the origin among all vices. Du wei wan er zhi yuan, right? Mm. Right, but what was gambling uh, like in local society? In Mazu, gambling has in, you know, has in contravention to the government's ban, gradually become embedded in their daily life. They told me, the harder they try to catch us, the more we gamble. Okay, firstly, government officials participated. Workers, for example, you know, if you read the Mazu newspaper, very interesting. 
they, they said workers, or not just workers, also, you know, higher level people, workers at the Mazu Distilli, the regulation of goods department, or even the publishing office of Mazu Daily, were caught gambling and named in the newspaper. They like to gamble in the offices. One informant working for the Mazu elect, uh, Electric Company recounted the situation of the, at the time to me. He said, back then, we never put away our office mahjong table. When the lunch break was up, everybody would rush to the table to get a spot. In order to keep a seat, some even skipped lunch completely. So they were so, you know, they, they just wanted to, you know. So I asked him, I asked him, why were people so crazy about gambling? You know, why did they just, so he said, I don't know, you, you know. It felt like this, this was the only way we could get through of the day. So it seemed that at, it's as if only by playing mahjong could one get rid of the boredom, boredom of civil service under the military rule and make life bearable. They, and then they did not just uh, like to gamble in offices, they also liked to gamble during uh, civil defense training, Ning Fang Shun Lian. An informant told me without any qualms. He said, an official would sit up on the stage with spit flying as he talked about how to take care of our firearms and defend ourselves against the communist spies. And we all be sitting there playing Chinese poker, dealing the cards under the table, under the table. And they were, people were, were even gambling during the military exercise, Jun Shi Yan Xi. The low meandering tunnels on the islands were a heaven for the Mazu people where they would not be seen by the commanding officers. So they, they keep on telling me, we could gamble even we had only 10 or 20 minutes. If we, had, uh, we were pressed for time, we deal two cards and then go by straight value. If we had a little bit more time, we deal four cards and go by pairs, pairs, right? So there are always, they told me, there are always a lot of flexibility in gambling. You can create your own, you know, just, uh, you know, have fun, uh, you know. And, okay, teachers, even teachers participated, involved. Some teachers would hide in a corner of the sc a school, uh, school library to gamble. They would arrange to meet ahead of time, and if they heard uh, footsteps approaching, they would immediately cover the mahjong tiles with the cloth and slump on the table, pretending to nap over their books. But didn't the government control gambling strictly and constantly <coughs> burn the equipment? I asked them, because what I heard, you know, from the newspaper, right? Oh, they said, there were lots of ways to get cards. For example, Mazu doesn't have any natural gas, so it had to be imported from Taiwan, right? So some people would saw a, a gas canister into house, and then stuff it with mahjong tiles, chess pieces, and playing cards, and then sewed it back uh, together. And after painting it, it looked indistinct, uh, it, you know, no different from the other uh, canister. And then we can get all this, you know, re, you know all these uh, uh, gambling equipment. Okay, and then women were no exception. Women selling goods to the soldiers would also gamble because they have money, right? particularly those who open shops to do G.I. Joe business, they often prefer to play dice, since it produces a quick winner, right? You just, uh, and would not take much time away from their tight schedules, because they have to look after their family, they have to do business. So they, they sort of, you know, they want something quick, you know, so they could go back to their, to their you know, to go back to, to their, their, you know, their routine life. So they knew that they were, actually they, they knew they were caught, if they were caught, they would be punished by having to sweep the streets, clean the gutters, or even incarceration. But they still sought out their secret games. After gambling for a short while, they would uh, hurry back to work, you know, back to the market to work, or home to cook for the children and take care, take care of their families. So gambling became a part of their daily routine. Okay, 
And finally, I would like to talk about another kind of gambling, which is related to the yellow croaker, uh, huang yu, huang yu catching. Huang yu is a kind of, especially the wild one, you know, the wild one is a lucrative fish, which the fishermen can sell for a large amount of money. So uh, you can see from this map, uh, Mosul Islands and the major islands are here. And the northeast island, Dongin, is here. So uh, yellow croaker migrated in schools, right? So they come from the mm -hmm. south. They usually come from the south to this area, to this Dongin area uh, from April to June each year. So uh, fishermen from the south will, you know, usually they will go to stay in Dongin for two or three months to catch this yellow croaker. <coughs> During the breeding, breeding season, the, the air bladders of the fish let off sounds that attract members of the other sex. In a, you know, in a particularly crowded school, the, no, the noise can sound like boiling water. So when there were fish detector at that, you know, at that time, uh, to locate where the fish is, right? Fishermen would uh, often rely on the sound of the school of, to estimate the size of yellow croaker. Just because the yellow, you know, the, the croaker made revealing noises doesn't mean that every fishing e expedition was successful. Fishing was also a matter of luck, right? It's uh, everything, e even you have everything ready, it's also very much about luck. So Dongin people say that when they caught yellow croaker, the excitement was just like gambling. They were, oh, why? Okay, this is the scene of catching the yellow croaker. Either the, 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 the color or the price of the yellow croaker is like finding gold. So when you catch the, you won't just catch one, you catch, you know, huge amount. So this is, uh, you know, they, they said if you catch just once, you follow, you, you know, you, you become prosperous, right? So you won't be surprised, you know, they, given all this, it's not surprising that when the fishermen return to the shore, they hold big, uh, big gambling parties, either to test their luck again or to celebrate a good catch the fishermen who caught croaker usually gamble in a heroic spirit. During the catch season, the gambling tables will be crowded with onlookers, forming a noisy, excited crowd. The gamblers bet, you know, a huge amount of uh, Chinese dominoes, paijiu or tianjiu, in fast-paced uh, games. A lot of money was quickly won and lost in each game. They, but they have to show, you know, they had to show they were indifferent to loss. The real purpose behind was to display, to compete, to show off, rather than consolidate the, the earnings. So every year, the, you know, for example, the sun, you know, the, the, the people told me, oh, we went there with empty pocket, but we still came back with empty pocket. Because everything you, you know, even you, you got a lot of, you know, yellow croaker, you were spent in this, in this, in, in this uh, the gambling. So, um, okay, Chinese dominoes are usually played, I mean, in the islands, in festivals. Playing dominoes play, uh, during the croaker seasons does constitute a ritualistic activity. Precisely because of this ceremonial nature, the military tended to look the other way and not shot the game song because it's so unusual just once a year. Only to depletion, the yellow croaker mostly disappeared after 1985. But elders still remember the season and the Chinese, you know, and they, the, the, the way they play these Chinese dominoes games as though you were, it were yesterday. They were so fond of talking about it. So um, it's, it's a rich in uh, resources in the field. You know, they, they, they just like to talk about it. Okay, concluding remarks. Anthropologists have discussed significances of gambling from different perspectives. Gambling is analyzed as a cultural metaphor of society, which, I mean, uh, Clif as Gil Clifford Gills argue in his very famous article, Deep, uh, you know, Deep Play, or a form of symbolic um, resistance to the state. This, uh, this kind of argument, 
you know, you will see this kind of argument a lot in, uh, in Greece or you know, Crete Islands. Uh, a lot of work is uh, done in this area about gambling. Or it's a way to, it's a way of un engaging with uncertainty. These are all uh, mostly um, uh, Greek or people who study uh, Greece. Gambling in Chinese society, especially mahjong, mahjong has uh, you know you know also received considerable consider uh, considerate uh, attention. Scholars have elucidated the cultural content of mahjong. You will see a lot of literature about this. They discuss uh, how gambling is related to the cultural concept of fate, luck, or skill. A lot of work are discussing this, and then how mahjong forms an analogies to other aspects of society. Uh, for example, it's a, you know, Indian, in, uh, an, uh, you know, um, immer, uh, immigrant society in India, in around uh, Calcutta, who talk about this uh, Chinese mahjong in, in, in that place, and Professor, Professor's work. Um, after night, after uh, 2000, a lot of work was done in, was uh, conducted in China. Uh, it's seen as a way for the Chinese villages to engage with neoliberalism. For example, Joe Bosco's work, or it's a means to contend, uh, it's a means for the, the Chinese peasants to contend with the boundaries between the rural and the urban local sociality and state uh, discourses. Uh, this is a, uh, quite a very new research conducted in, uh, I think, Hebei province. My analysis different from previous scholars examines can gambling diachronically and synchronically. I discuss how gambling in Mazu developed from a leisure activity for men in the fishing society to an everyday practice of the, ge of the general population during the military reign. Gambling was no longer limited to a particular time, space, or group of people during the war zone administration period, but extended it to all levels of society and involved both men and women. Spatially, it covered the public, sphere, uh, public space, for example, dominoes or fishermen, and the private domain, for example, cars, gambling under the table at the civil defense training or the military exercise and turnovers in the military exercise. As for time, it included the ritualistic moments as well as day-to-day -day life. Various forms of gambling corresponded to the life rhythm of different people. Lengthy games of mahjong liven up the dull routines of low-level government workers. Rapid dice games offer a break to women during their hectic days engaging in GI Joe business. The excitement involved in Chinese dominoes mimic the risk and the festivity of the yellow croaker fishing. As the war zone administration was uh, abolished in 1992, uh, when the government stopped arresting people, they told me it wasn't as exciting anymore. A lot of people just quit. As the war zone administration approached its <coughs> end, the Mazu daily records, records of gambling arrests decreased noticeably. You don't see this, you know, much. Uh, the, be, after 1985, it declined. The reports of gambling declined. Oh, sorry. Does the reasons why gambling became a daily practice go beyond what previous studies tells us? In this talk, I try to go through the ethnography to show how Mazu people both contended with and endure the military rule in terms of their gambling culture. Gamble is, gambling is not only a cultural practice or social resistance, but also an emotional outlet, a stage for enacting humor, ridicule, and anger. Thank you. So this is an anthropological
echo cliche, but your um, description of uh, gambling before 1949 in these villages that are facing outward to the sea and to China and other islands um, by men who were who were using it as a form of sociality, and but also about it's about their rep reputation. It reminds me of nothing more than. Um, than um, Tim Scala, Nancy Munn's analysis of the, of the cooler break, where men are going out to other islands to exchange armbands and, and, uh, and uh, what are they, sorry, necklaces, um, it, as a way to, to become, to, to enhance, to blow up their rep reputations. Um, and they're, you know, it's, it's risky and, it's, and, it's, um, and it, it requires uh, you know, bravery and it requires them to seduce each other. It, it makes me want to ask, like, well, who are these guys gambling with it, before 1949, say, just for that? Are they gambling with each, with each other on, 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 on a particular island? Are they going to other islands to gamble? Or is it, a, is it an inter-island kind of exchange deal? Or is it just concentrated within one little island? Uh, after they came back, they usually stay in there in, you know, um, in their own island, they did not go to, as far as I know, they did not go to the, the, but other islands, but you see different boats, right? So they will encounter different situations. So when they came, when they go to different places to fish, right? So after they came back, they just were, they just, uh, they just went for gambling and then exchange news, or oh, what you see in that direction or that direction. And they were boasting what I heard from them, you know, for example, the sons, they told me, oh, they were boasting all the time, oh, wow, how much fish, you know, just, just pass by them. So it's a way that, you know, what masculinity was, you know, was produced, right? They were, they were showing off, oh, how, how you know, how much uh, difficulty I encountered and I, I, I just conquered that and then come home, something like, but they also exchange, you know, their, their, you know, uh, as I said, you know, the, the, uh, ne the news of the tide, the fish, and then the weather, and they also talk about, oh, how other people, uh, you know, uh, you know th what they thought about other people. So I think this is a very much men's, men's work. This is why in earlier stage, you see all about men. It's about gambling, gambling or whoring. And it's a way, you know, that's why they said that if you don't gamble, if you don't whore, uh, uh, you know, you, you have no power, you have no money. Hmm. Yes, please. Sorry, sorry, again? The, the game, uh. a game of gambling. It's also a way of cover up for the spy from China. Cover up the Spy, what, what do you mean? Like a, uh, a lot of the Chinese spies could sneak into the um, archery. And the way oh. to cover it up would be just play the game. So uh, they can cover each other. And a spy would be kind of mingle in the local um, uh, residence that won't be identified. And oh. won't be kind of betrayed. If you Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, I never heard about that. You know, because it's a military island, right? So, um, uh, what I heard, you know, if a spy came, usually the this person would be caught immediately, or you know, the the villages. I mean, this is an island which uh, had a, a very strict military uh, regulation. So, never heard anyone who play mahjong or play this gamble. This things with, with the Chinese. Uh, but like you say, you know, the, the island is really close to China. Mm. And they always have fights. They always have trouble. And the military, they just cannot work this 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. People can come and go. People, people can mingle together and use the um, kind of a game of, of gambling. It's also a way of snow. Uh, it's it's very strict, you know, as you, I show the 90, uh, 95 military bases, checkpoints, very strict. Oh, right, so I never heard them uh, saying that they play with, uh, 
the Chinese uh, spies or something. The, the, story, uh, the stories I heard that is always about how Chinese spies were tortured, were kept in prison, and then and you know how people saw them being tortured. So they, yeah, are you mad? Mean, So sorry, the yeah, but they were all in the prison. Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, I just have a question about today. I remember last year the human had voted to decide whether to to, to have this government business. Right. Um, because it was to attack the travelers from from mainland China. Uh huh. Do you find any connection between what you described as today's debate in the mainland? Right, right. Thank you for asking this question. Fit with what I want. <laughs> my um, section three of my book will be all about casino because uh, Ma Zhu passed by. Th their referendum says yes to casino gambling. So this is the only referendum, you know, the, the, which uh, accepts, you know, a me meaning Ma Zhu people welcome gambling, you know, the American. Uh, a uh, uh, capitalist uh, uh, person to set up uh, a, a, gam a casino in, uh, in, in Mazu. But then finally, the central government did not allow them to, to set up. So, so my section three, you know, section three will be about how they, why did they, you know, how they accepted uh, the, the casino. Because in Taiwan, you know, it's almost impossible. And in Jinmen too, Jinmen totally over, overruled this, right? They had a referendum twice and then over it, uh, overruled, but Mazu su succeeded. Mm -hmm. And I, my argument, in a way, I wanted to pursue this. Mm -hmm. You know, the gambling culture is sort of like their blood flowing in the veins, you know? Mm -hmm. They are used to it. So um, they, they accepted gambling, but then, Anyway, but so this is quite complicated, you know, the whole process that, you know, that because it's, I think it's happened in 2013, the referendum was, was done in that time. So it's a very big issue, you know, in, 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 in Taiwan or, you know, in, in that island too. So uh, teachers, you know, every social groups came out and then, and then discussed about this issue. But really, uh, all the offshore islands, you know, including Jinmen, Penghu, they all overrule. Only Mazu accepted. And at the same time, uh, the island before 1949 is also like uh, where people don't necessarily have a sense of like community mm. or so people are moving more towards China as like communities align. So that's always a very interesting dynamic. There, there's a sociality without trying to group people as like belonging to a social realm. I'm just curious what happened in terms of gambling and the sociality around gambling post. 1949, like, what people are talking about when they're gambling, are they still that strain of social information, or how that affects people's connections or sense of connection with this island, or like the United Kingdom connection? Right. Um, I should say, you know, before, I think this, the, the contrast is very interesting, you know, before 19, 1949 and after 1949, because it's, before 1949, it's a totally broken society. You know, for example, uh, the the place where I did my field work, it's not a you know only 500 people, but they 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 did a ritual 11 times. Oh, I was very surprised. How come in such a you know they did the lantern festival, Yuan and then each neighborhood did their you know uh, took how should I say organized their own festival. So each neighborhood has its own. And so in such a small village, they, they did Lantern Festival 11 times. So I, then I, it, it interested me at the beginning, oh, how come? So then I started to investigate and why, and then I found this. 
right? Because in each neighborhood, they all have their own connection with, with China, either the same lineage or they are uh, sort of Tong uh, Tongxiang. They uh, move from Changle or from certain uh, village. So they group together in, the, in, the, in, in one uh, neighborhood. And sometimes be among these, these islands, they contact, they had uh, further contact with the other islands because the same lineage people were scattered to different islands. So, so for example, Changle people would tend to contact with each other. They don't want to, they don't want it to interact with the people in that in the same place. Why? Because they are, you know, they told me, we are ready to go home anytime. This is not our this is not our you know permanent place. So we value the the the, the you know sort of natural you know, connections among islands, right? So I think this is why when the army came, the islands, even each island were cut off because, because they know Chinese, uh, Chinese army would come and then occupy one, uh, one island. So the other islands would be able, would be trying to fight for itself. So they, they said Tongdao Yimin could be one island, share one fate, or all the five islands together share one fate. So this is different level, like even preach a segmentary uh, system, right? The lineage system from the very trivial and then, okay, group into a, a, a big one. So I think uh, uh, during the military period, uh, the, the, the army was trying to educate them by saying, we were together, you know, we have to fight for China. So uh, this sort of, uh, you know, that's why they set up the, the, the uh, school, the schools and keep on teaching them. We, the army are terrible. It's sort of not, um, the Chi uh, Chinese government was, was terrible. So we have to be together. So I think at that moment, I can't deny that a shared community has started, has formed. So now if you go there, they, you will, they will say, we are Masu people. We are fight against the China. So that kind of sense has already grown up. And also, they were so far away from Taiwan, right? And Taiwan people speak Southern Chinese, uh, Southern Fujian dialect, whereas these people speak Eastern Fujian dialect. They hate D DPP, you see what I mean? They think DPP people, uh, the, 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 you know, they, they, they like the Nationalist Party, KMT, so much. 99% of them vote for P DP, uh, KMT. So they feel that we were fighting, we were helping Taiwan to fight against China. So they have the very strong sense of, you know, we sacrifice ourselves to protect Taiwan. So that kind of, uh, uh, how should I say, that kind of community or the, the communal sense has really, you know, grown up, has really gr grown up during the military period. This, I think I can't deny. Right, so that's why when I went there, they would say, "Oh, you know, we are, you know, we 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 were, you know, we we uh, we, we sacrifice ourselves." Then go back to what you were talking, uh, what you were you were asking. One thing I did not say here, I think it's the uh, uh, classmate, uh, 同学, because there are so many schools set up, right? So schools sort of mix people, the children together. And then it's for them, it's actually difficult, to, you know, to, to, to go to Taiwan because it's for, for them, it's actually difficult to compete with the education system in Taiwan, right? So they like, they, I mean, uh, culturally, they speak different dialect. They can't understand uh, Taiwanese ex, uh, uh, dialect, right? And then they grew up together. These people, you know, youngster people, they, they, they sort of brought up together. So that kind of classmate, classmateship or, you know, 同学 becomes very important. So in the section, for example, in later section, I will talk about that. When they were liber liberated, you know, when people were liberated, how these local elites started to build, you know, the social imagination, how it was formed, and how these local elites sort of, uh, they were all classmates to each other. And they were sort of helping each other and then build up the, the, the you know, try to figure out a plan for, for this, 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 this very small island, you know. So later on, I will talk about how this, you know, for example, how they, uh, 
even the protest, the 1992, a lot of people you know, started to go for protest, the street protest, and then these classmates, in a way, help each other, you know, cover each other. So I think uh, classmate is the most significant element appearing in this, this period and becomes very influential in the next stage. And also, also, I also uh, before I did not, I did not say it. Um, before, during, before 1949, people say uh, visiting other visiting other villages. They call it crossing mountain, Guo Shan. They are uh, meaning each I, each villages. You know, they were located in the uh, inlet, right? So it's very difficult for them to cross the mountain to cross the mountain and then to visit their the people. But then when the army came, they built central road to connect all the villages together. So, so the army, and then also the armies divided the villages into nine Chunzi. Uh, Before, they don't have the sense of Chunzi. You know, just uh, oh, the Aoko, we uh, live around the inlet. That's all, we women drew Aoko. But, but the army, when the army came, they set up, you know, they divided the administrative units, right? So you are this unit, you are this village, I am this village. So they started to have the sense of, uh, oh, we belong to this village, right? And then after 1992, when they started can vote, uh, sorry, when they can vote, the villages have to fight for each other. So that's why, you know, finally they think, oh, if we don't unite together and compete with the other villages we will be ruined. So that's why finally 11 uh, lantern festivals, you know, the festivals were united into one. So because they were competing with, uh, you know, and the sense of, I think the administration really, I think uh, Benedict Anderson also say that, you know, administration unit has a huge impact on humans, uh, you know, uh, sense. The dialect spoken in the uh, Matsu area is the same as uh, in Fuzhou is the uh, so-called Minde, uh, uh, Mingdong, Nordan, Mingdong or uh, Hukianin. Right. Mi How they come they have no connect, no camaraderie? You know, they fear the same. They have the same speaking, same language, same dialect. Uh, you mean the people inside or yeah, the, the people in Matsu mm. speak? Actually, like people in Fuzhou, mm -hmm. same same dialect. Sure. And they are different from Taiwanese in, uh -huh. in Taiwan or right. in Kenmon or Matsu. Uh -huh. So why don't they fear? They have more keen uh, feeling, you know, warm feeling toward the Chinese. Uh, you know, just next, just across the uh, island. Uh, you know, they they would be. You know, I. I are there any people who swim across the uh, the strait and then uh, you know report it or uh, to escape or uh, right. you know yeah, to right right okay uh, of course they had a very strong uh, uh, identity you know they with Fuzhou people they said we are you know they speak. They, even now they speak Fuzhou dialect, right? right? So they have, uh, they feel that they are so different from Taiwanese. Right. But they are also different from Chinese. So they are in between. You see, I think they were struggling. They have uh, uh, that kind of uh, struggling identity. I think this is what my uh, second uh, chapter, the, the section two and section three were uh, will be exploring about their new identity. So, so you can read the book. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thanks very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.